We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel. We've got extra copies if you didn't bring one with you and you'd like one to follow along. And this is a great day to make sure you got one in front of you. Uh, we're going to do Hebrews chapter 13 today. And uh, we've been calling our overall study of the book of Hebrews, The Incomparable Christ. It begins that way right out of the chute. It doesn't sound like a letter on the front end. It does on the back end. Uh, some would say it's a sermon. Others have said it's a letter. I'm going to say it's a sermon that got mailed to somebody, and so it's a little bit of both. And they tagged on a, a sal- or, or, or kind of a closing greeting at the end, which we will read today as part of chapter 13. But we've been in this book for 18 weeks, and uh, it was written to a group of Jewish people who had become Christians living in the Roman Empire and beginning to experience a bit of persecution. Uh, Their belongings had been confiscated. Some of their homes had been confiscated. Some of them were suffering uh, physical persecution, although not to the point of uh, dying just yet. But that's coming, as we know our history just a little bit. That is indeed coming. Roman Emperor Nero is probably the one who is in power. He ruled uh, from 54 to 68 A.D., And uh, we think this book was probably written somewhere in the mid-60s sometime, uh, certainly before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Why do we think this book was written before that time? Because it seems to mention some of the cultic practices that went on at the temple, and one would think they would have said something about the temple had it been destroyed. Um, But here we have a group of people that are suffering under some socio-political pressure, some of them fearful and faltering, wobbly in their faith. Uh, even considering some of them were considering forsaking the gospel altogether, going back to Judaism, uh, to religious rule following, because in that particular climate, that was still acceptable to the governmental authorities, whereas the Christian movement was not. The Christians wouldn't bow to the emperor. The Christians were seen as a a subgroup of the Jews for a while, and then eventually that there became this distinction between the two of them. So we come to this final chapter, and it's a great chapter to end our study on, not only because it's the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, but because uh, it does such a great job answering the question if authentic faith in the incomparable Christ looks like something, what does it look like? Um, this chapter is the answer to that big question, so what? You've been doing this for 18 weeks, so what? What difference does it make to our lives and all of this, you know, all these years later? Um, and there, the book overflows with mind-blowing indicatives about Christ. He's greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than the prophets, greater than the high priests that have come and gone, greater than the sacrifices that have been offered. He's the ultimate Lamb of God. We've seen all of that, how he's the incomparable Christ. But what difference does that make in our practical everyday lives, especially for those of us that may or may soon to be going through some kind of persecution, some kind of difficulty, some kind of loss? It may not be persecution at all for our faith, but we might be just suffering. Uh, some of us are facing loss. Some of us are facing uh, right around the corner, and we, we, some of us don't even know it, that we're facing some kind of disappointment. Uh, Some of us are living in the middle of it even right now. Well, if anyone wants to know what an unquenchably hope-filled, inexhaustibly joy-overflowing, vital, vibrant, conscience, healthy, gospel-centered, character-building, relationship-healing, life-transforming faith looks like, Hebrews 13 is going to help us out with that. How was that for a run-on sentence, by the way? Did I do okay? I was trying to run it on as long as I could, uh, but I'm, I'll never hold a candle to the Apostle Paul. Um, Burke Parsons uh, has said, he's the uh, pastor at St. Andrew's Chapel in Sanford, Florida. He says, a crowd of people in a building isn't necessarily a community. Real community exists where we don't need to wear masks, where true friends bear our burdens, and where we can confess our biggest sins, and our church family still loves us. And I think that's what was going on here. I think this was a group of people, probably a small setting, maybe even a house church. Uh, we're getting these, all these indicatives from this author who you'll see today really knew them pretty well. Um, it hasn't been incredibly personal, but it's going to end up that way. Uh, we're going to study Philippians next. It's really personal. He talks in the first person all the time. And, and the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the church at Philippi. But here we have a group of people that are a community, but it's not just a shallow group of people. This isn't just the first church of the supernatural feels. 
This is not just the first church of your best life now movement. It's not the first church of socio-political advocacy group that's mad about everything. It's not the first church of the mind-numbed, ambiguous love cult either, L-U-V, not L-O-V-E. This is a church that has been a group of people that really radically changed to follow Jesus, but they've been shaken, and uh, it's been difficult for them. And so all these amazing indicatives about Christ, all this seeking to persuade them not to forsake Jesus, but to continue to follow Jesus, because Jesus is incomparable. He is the one. You need to look no further. And even if you suffer, he's worth trusting and depending upon. So let's look then at chapter 13. You know what? I like therefores, so let's go back two verses. Therefore, verse 28 of chapter 12, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service of reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. That's what we ended with last week. Some of you went home going, wow, that's a tough statement. Uh, It's really good. Uh, It's actually, we want, those of us that love justice, if you admit that you love justice, you want a God who actually intends to set things right one day and to do away with everything that's wrong and broken in the world. Uh, I want that. Uh, I want a God who can do that. Why? Because I really don't like the way the world is broken. I don't, even, I don't like the way I'm broken either. And I want him to set me right, and I want, him, I want him to set everything right. And for this entire world that we experience, and for if we're going to live for eternity, I want it to be right. And God's the only one that can actually do that. Well, there are no chapter breaks in the ancient manuscript copies that we have of the New Testament. So you see one right after our God is a consuming fire. You see it says chapter 13. That's because those chapter breaks were added, I believe, 12th, 13th century, right in there by a guy named Stephen Langdon. And later on, some verse breaks were added as well. But the author of Hebrews just kept right on rolling. He said, our God is a consuming fire. So let love of the brethren continue, implying that you could stop it, but you shouldn't. Why? Well, because you, you have the incomparable Christ as your king and as your savior and as your redeemer. So you ought to let the love of the brethren continue. That's really awesome. We should be marked by the love of the brethren. That's not just a cheap veneer love, L-U-V. This is really deep commitment love. The kind of love that when you see it, you are startled by it or in awe of it or hushed by it or in some way you find yourself longing for it because you see it in somebody and you, you can't even imagine how they could love each other that well. Let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect. And by the way, there's like 20 um, exhortations here in this chapter. I'm going to put up on the screen in a minute about 10 of them, but you, you go ahead and see if you can find the you know, in the, if, find the 20 of them if you want to make little notes. First one's verse 1. Second one, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Isn't that awesome? Kind of harkens back to the time, the story of Abraham, when those three visitors came and showed up, and he and Sarah were like, Whoa, who are these people? And it became apparent to them after a while that they were really heavenly messengers. One of them even called the Lord. And, uh, and, and yet... Had they rebuffed them, turned them away, they would have missed the opportunity to be with them. Does that mean I believe in angels? You bet I believe in angels. Uh, You know, every Sunday I stand up here and I look around and I go, who are all those people I've never seen before? And I'm not saying you're angels. I mean, you know, some of you, I mean, look look at the person's back in front of you. See if they got some wings folded up in the back of their jacket there. is it possible that we entertain angels and don't know it? Well, I think that's what this is saying. Um, does that mean we get fixated with non angels? No. And there's only two angels in the entire Bible that even get named, and they are who? Gabriel and Michael. Right, that's right, yeah. But the thousands of other angels don't even get a name. But yet they're serving God. They're serving before his throne in worship. They're serving as he sends his messengers. Angels means messengers out into the world to do his bidding, to accomplish his purposes, to tend to his people 
in so many beautiful ways that God has designed. And we're all going to have our minds blown when all that becomes apparent to us at some point. So if you come in here on a given Sunday and you look around, you see somebody you don't know, be hospitable, will you? (laughs) Be a host. Don't think of yourself as a guest every time you walk in a room. Um, You might be entertaining angels without knowing it. Verse 3, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated, since you yourself are also in the body. And I think the idea, the the implication there is that since you're also in a human body and you also might be ill-treated at some point, you should be compassionate toward those who are incarcerated. I love that we as a church support financially and some of our men volunteer with an organization called Men of Valor. If you're a, a male and you're here today and you're trying to find a way to put some feet on your faith and you'd like to put some of God's love in motion, man, spending some time uh, becoming a mentor, uh, leading a Bible. So there's so many different ways you can do that. Men of Valor on our website, great place to do that. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. Verse 4, for fornicators, that's people that have sex outside of marriage, and adulterers, that's people that have sexual relations with persons who are not their spouse. Those are the, right here it says, for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge, all right? So somebody came up to me after the last uh, sermon and said, man, that's pretty clear. I said, yes, that's that's very clear. Yes, God is the designer and the creator of everything. I mean, he spoke all of this into being. Um, And and so, yes, he has a design and an intent and, and as the creator, he actually has a right to speak into our world about how we might uh, enjoy or use or uh, 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 employ the different things that he's created, that he's created to be used for good. And so I know that people struggle with this kind of thing. I know that every time I talk to a couple that's about to get married, you know, and I tell them, you know, there's, there's three or four things that are sort of the main cause, primary cause of a lot of marriages that fall apart. Here's two of them right here. Their, human sex, their view of human sexuality. And then secondly, verse 5 says here, let your character be free from the love of money. There's nothing wrong with money itself. It's the love of It's the obsession with money. It's the obsession with human sexuality. And if we live in a day and age that is obsessed with any two things, it's at least those two things. To the point where we find our identity in our money, we find our identity sometimes in our poverty. We find our identity sometimes in our human sexuality. And we actually, when you start connecting your identity to those things, that's when you start to turn it into an idol. That's when it becomes the center for you. And here he's saying to us, let marriage be held in honor, the marriage bed undefiled, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. It's very clear. Your character must be free from the love of money. So whether you got a lot or you got a little, it doesn't matter. Don't love money. Don't let it own you. You can own it, and if you can get a big paycheck, get the biggest one you can get, but don't let it own you. Be free from the love of money. Be content. See, this is the real purpose of this is right here. Be content with what you have. And I listen, folks, I know some people that are really, really wealthy that are not content. So it's not about how much money you have. But I also know some people that are really poor and are not content. So to be content means to find in God my contentment. And that's why he goes on to say, for he himself has said, in other words, this is connected. Our view of God is actually connected with our contentment. For he himself has said, and I love this, as he, as he begins to um, reach back into our Old Testament and draws from Deuteronomy in Psalm 118, he says, I will never leave you or desert you, another way to say it, I'll, I'll never abandon you, nor will I ever forsake you, and uh, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper or my help. I will not be afraid. What? shall man or what can man do what can anyone do to me great questions meant 
to rhetorically stir us up to ask that question. In other words, if I belong to God completely, if God will never abandon me, if God has got me, if He will hold me fast, how can I be afraid of anything? If we have a healthy fear of God, we say around here all the time, we don't really need to have an unhealthy fear of anyone else or anything else, of anyone else, you know, what people think of me, whether I have enough followers or not, uh, that none of that, ma- none of that is going to shape and form and mold me or give me any sense of value at all if I keep it all in the right perspective, see? I won't be obsessed with what others say. I'm more concerned with what God thinks. And He's the one that's made these promises. I'll never leave you. I'll never abandon you. And if He's your help, you don't need to be afraid of anything. Verse 7, remember those who led you, another of his imperatives or exhortations, whoever's writing the book of Hebrews. Remember those who led you, past tense, and those ones that brought you to Christ. They spoke the word of God to you. And considering the result of their conduct, in other words, the fruit of the way they behave because they believe in Jesus, imitate their faith, he says. Paul says something similar elsewhere where he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's great. In other words, it's not wrong to look at somebody who's led you to Christ or someone who's a little more mature in you in Christ and see when they're behaving like Jesus, you see in them something you want to emulate. That's really okay. Does that mean you'll never be let down by somebody in in the faith? No, it doesn't mean you'll never be let down by somebody. I'm going to let, I let people down all the time. You're going to let people down. Um, uh, Some of us have some really painful memories of hurt in our past in, within the church and where spiritual leaders uh, in some way failed us. But in as much as our leaders are reminding us of the gospel and showing us the gospel at work or preaching the gospel to us, we're to imitate that faith. Verse 8 stands out almost like a sore thumb. Look at it. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. And why is that standing like a sore thumb? Because it's not an exhortation. It's an indicative. He's gone back to an indicative, and it's an awesome one. This is probably the most popular verse in this chapter. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So no matter what happened with your leaders, if they failed you, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This same Jesus that he's inviting them, encouraging them to hold fast to, to maintain their faith in Jesus He's the fixed point on the horizon that we all desperately want and need. Even some of the great philosophers, some of the existentialists used to say, uh, a finite point has no meaning unless it has an infinite reference point. And the Bible says there is an infinite reference point, and his name is Jesus. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that about his ontological reality, his being, or is that about his character? Yes, it's both. It's about who he is and who he will always be. I don't know about you, but we live in a world where everything's planned obsolescence, man. Everything you buy that they told you to buy, you got to have this. This is awesome. And you buy it, and it's awesome. And then three months later, you know what? This is awesome now. And and they tell you that. and And they're the same ones that told you that was awesome, right? So awesome is planned obsolescence is what it is, yeah, because they want us to keep buying, keep buying, keep buying, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I can count on him. I can hope in him because not only is he ontologically the same entity, but he's faithful yesterday. He's faithful today, and he'll be faithful tomorrow. You can count on him. Verse 9, don't be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were thus occupied were not benefited. Now, this is a little, you're kind of going, what's this about food? I like food. Raise your hand if you like food. I love food. We all like food. Can't wait to get to lunch, all that stuff. Got it. Um, But what he's talking about here is that those who sort of had all the, in their religious experience, had all these dietary laws that they honored and kept, and they thought by doing so they could earn God's favor in some way. And uh, what he's saying here is don't be carried away by these sort of varied and strange teachings that if you, if you eat enough cauliflower, God will love you. 
That's not true, trust me, okay? I'm pretty certain about that one, yeah. Um, that, that's not true. Don't be carried away by varied and strange teachings. Okay, so when the latest craze comes along, the most novel thing to happen theologically, let's redefine something that has been settled in the church for 2,000 years. Don't be duped by that. Now, does that mean we can't learn anything new? No, we can learn a lot of new things. But just don't fall so quickly to everything. Just because it's novel doesn't make it right. Just because it's against what has been settled scripture and all that for years and years and years, just because it sort of runs in favor of the culture doesn't make it right. We've got to always be asking ourselves, are we just being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and every novel thing that comes along? Or is the timeless truth of Scripture really our standard for what is true and right and good and beautiful? Has God been speaking about this or that subject, whatever it might be? It's important for us to have that. Again, we're looking for a fixed point on the horizon so that we're not just sort of tossed about in the Bermuda Triangle Sea of theological novelty. Um, we have an altar, verse 10, from which those who serve the tabernacle or those who follow rules and religious rule following and think they're earning following the law, they have no right to eat. Why? Well, because they've chosen to follow the law on their own. Self-righteousness is kind of what they're all about, and they think they can impress God with their rule following. See, we don't have that same altar. That's not the same one for us. For the bodies of those animals, verse 11, whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest, and again, this is one of the reasons I don't think the temple's gone away, as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. That's true. That's the way they used to do it, especially on the Day of Atonement. The scapegoat, they would lay their hands on the scapegoat, and they'd send that, that goat out into the wilderness, out of the city, and all of their sins symbolically laid on the head of that goat. And yet... What this guy's going to tell us, this writer of Hebrews, is that Christ has come and paid the price. We don't have to wonder what happened. We already know what happened. Jesus has paid the price once and for all. Hence, let us go out uh, to him, verse 13, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. If, man, if the world reproached Christ, if the world reviled Christ, if the world said uh, Jesus is a fool and everybody that follows him is a fool as well, great, I'm a fool. I'll be a fool next to Jesus any day. We do not have a lasting city. For here, we do not have a lasting city. Within religion, we don't. Verse 14. But we are seeking the city which is to come. In other words, there is a future. There is a destiny for the people who have trusted in the Christ who's the same yesterday, today, and forever the same. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice in praise to God. The fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. I hope that you do that when you come and when we gather together. I hope that we don't just vibrate vocal cords, but that we're actually offering up a sacrifice of praise to God. Do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Verse 16, very clear. If it looks like something, what does it look like? If this vertical relationship with God that you have and that I have because we've trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior, if that vertical relationship has any kind of horizontal impact, what does it look like? It looks like verse 16. Don't neglect doing good. And sharing, it seems like the most simple of things to be reminding us of. But it's important, isn't it? Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And this is probably advice for them concerning their, again, if this is a small house church or even a, a, a small assembly, um, the idea is that they're, they have a responsibility to watch over your souls. Their responsibility isn't just to put on a good show just to have good music and, and some kind of dynamic sermon. No, they're supposed to be watching over our souls. That's what we hope they're doing. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. That's so true. How many of you grew up? Now, don't raise your hand on this one. I, but I grew up in a church where it was sort of like cur, everybody was curmudgeon church. First church of the curmudgeon, man. Every, you walk in and literally, you know, 
you, you kind of check your emotions at the door, first of all, and then you walk into the sanctuary, you sit down, fold your hands. You're not allowed to talk. You're not allowed to say anything. Um, uh, and they, they get up front, and they sing these songs. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm thinking, notify your face, man. You, you're not, you're not, this is not going in. I don't believe you. This is not seem to be making it from your vocal cords into your life in any way, shape, or form. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't draw me in at all, that kind of thing. It is unprofitable. Verse 18, pray for us. And here's where he gets personal. For we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this so that I may, uh, this is great, that I may be restored to you the sooner. He, he really is talking like a pastor now, isn't he? It's not just indicatives, indicatives, indicatives. is isn't, you know, it's not that. But now it's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm longing to see you again. And, and then we have this benediction, verse 20. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do as well, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Everybody said, amen. It means truly. It means, it's like saying verily or truly. And then, it, again, it closes like a letter. Why? Because it's got this little, I call it a postscript, if you will. He goes, oh, and by the way, I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. In other words, I may just have backed the truck up and dumped about 20 exhortations on you, which he did. And they're pretty, and it starts with, hey, love each other. Okay, good. That's great. But it, there's 20 of them, and, and if, it might feel like a big dump truck full of, here's stuff to do. Um, but he's saying, bear with this word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. In other words, it could have been 50. You know, it could, could have been a lot more. I could have brought the bigger truck, but I didn't. And some of you really are asking the same question that Kim's dad is asking. How do we make it real? What does it really look like to follow Christ, the incomparable Christ? What does it really look like to so trust Christ that in the face of a world that says, you can do anything you want with your body. You can do anything you want with your money. You don't have to worry about the poor. You don't, you don't have to worry about how you're using or abusing each other. You can do anything. You're the center. It, it, no, in the face of 13 chapters of Christ is the center. See? Here's what he says it looks like. It begins with the love of the brethren, the love of the church. And he says, I hope you'll bear with this word of exhortation. I've written to you briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released with whom, if he comes soon, I shall see you. So evidently, they knew Timothy, Paul's young protege from the city of Lystra up in Asia Minor. Evidently, Timothy's still around. Evidently, they had Timothy in prison or something, and he's been released now. And whoever wrote Hebrews, whether it's Barnabas or, you know, I don't know, I don't know who, who wrote it. But whoever it is knows Timothy too and is thinking about traveling to be with these people. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints. And then he says this interesting little bit of live body detail. Those from Italy greet you. What is that? I mean, some people say, well, that means this book, Hebrews, was written from Italy. Could have been. Or in 49 AD when Emperor Claudius ran a bunch of Jews and Christians out of Rome, a bunch of them could have resettled somewhere in Greece. And in their little neighborhood, all of us from Italy say, hey, what's going on? As they're writing to people in Jerusalem, you know? All the Italians in Corinth say, hey, what's up? Come visit us. We got some great lasagna here. We want to cook for you, you know? And then he closes. I love this. It's so personal. I love this. He closes with these beautiful words, five words. Grace be with you all. That's so beautiful. What a great book. I always uh, get a little verklempt whenever we close out a book because I, I they're like old friends to me, you know, these, these amazing books. All right, so I'll make it easy for you. There's 10 of the imperatives, 10 of the exhortations. They're not all up there. Like I said, I think there's more like 20, but be loving people. Be loving. When you come in here, think like a host, not like a guest. You be loving. 
you, you coming in here, you're going, well, I came in here to be loved. Well, that's good. Give away what you need and watch what happens. I came in here to give, I came in here to get some encouragement. Great. Give away what you need and watch what happens. This is the way Jesus did this. See, he gave away his life so that you and I could find life. And see, he's just calling us to do the same thing, sacrificial love. Uh, hospitable, I know that, that, that that's, that's hard. That's hard for a lot of us, you know, especially the introverts in here to be hospitable, to be like, you know, that, you know, that 90 seconds where we do the stand and greet, some of you are dying a thousand deaths, you know. It's just, it's okay. Be compassionate. Yeah. Are you giving yourself away anywhere? You ought to be able to think of a place where you're giving yourself away right now. Okay? If you can't, if you, if you need some ideas, contact the church. We've we got all kinds of good ideas. Second Saturday is a city service. Great place to start. Be faithful. Do you know how important that is to Jesus? He was talking to the Pharisees once, and they were all braggadociously talking about how they tithe their mint and their dill and their, their, even all of their little herbs that they cook from. And Jesus said, you know what? That's nonsense. You've forgotten the, most, the heavier, weightier matters of the law. Faithfulness, mercy, and justice. Jesus loves faithfulness. God loves faithfulness. And it ought to mark his people. Pure. Be pure. Is pure a good word? Yes, it's a good word. It's not a good word in the culture in which we live. The culture in which we live says, man, you're just an animal. Indulge yourself in every way you want. Just act like an animal. If you want it, that's what validates it. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says you've been created in the image of God. You're something other than an animal. You're something more than just an animal, indulging your desires recklessly without regard to others. See, in the animal world, they eat each other. In the people world, we're not supposed to do that. I don't know if anybody has noticed that or not, but that's the idea. Um, be pure. Sexually, be, be pure in your conduct. Don't just use somebody. And that, that goes for married or don't use somebody. Be content. Be confident in the Lord. Oh, that's, see right there, we could camp out on confident in the Lord. That would be, man, if we, if we, if we just found our confidence in him because he has promised to never leave me nor forsake me. So now I don't have to be afraid of anything. Anything. Death itself included. And he's saying that these people that are being persecuted. Be watchful imitators of those who have been faithful followers of Jesus. Be steadfast in grace. That's so important. You know, especially when you've got a chapter like this that's like the dump truck of exhortation, you know, with all the specificity and all that. You know, all of that, the backdrop to all of that is grace, God's grace. You know, the backdrop to all of that. See, because every single one of us, has, has failed in all of these categories. Every single one of us has failed in every one of these categories, at least in our heart, if not with our bodies. And so what we need is grace. We still need to be reminded of the ways of God. That's true. How to walk in the ways of God. That's true. What's tr what does God think is true and right and good and beautiful? Yes, I need all of that. But I also always need to be reminded that I can't outrun his grace. No matter how much I messed up, Jesus came to, to die for sinners such as me, such as you. So let's be confident in his grace, in his mercy, and be steadfast in it. And the great response, the proper response is always to be worshipful. All right, let me just close out with some of my favorite, four of my favorites um, from some quotes that I think will summarize some of this. True faith, which springs into being from the love of God, must itself blossom out into love for our fellow man. Brotherly love. Philadelphia is the hallmark of the genuine Christian. Philip Hughes, great commentary on the book of Hebrews. Chandler teaching about it as well. This uh, preacher from uh, Dallas, a church called the Village Church, actually. By developing an appetite for what is good, you'll lose an appetite for what is bad. You do what you do because you want to. You haven't cultivated an appetite for what's better than that. Change your appetite. Cultivate an appetite for what's beautiful, what's eternal, and that's what you will crave. Um, I don't know if you're here today and you, you have a, a, a sort of a, a, lock addiction, a locked-in addiction for some kind of beverage, 
you know, that, that uh, like soft drink or something like that. And you've ever tried, you know, you thought to yourself, I got to go, I got to go to diet drinks, you know. And you just, you just go, no, that is the most reprehensible taste of rust in my mouth. I can't stand diet drinks. Is that you raise, no, you don't have to raise your hand. But it's really hard to change your, desire, your taste for something. It's really hard to do. But I'm going to go further and say what you really need is, because I've seen what a spoon does inside a Diet Coke for like a month if you put it on the counter. It's not good. It's not, it's not a good thing. Water. Water is really awesome. Now, again, these are not rules to follow. I'm just giving you an example of how you can change your taste for something. Okay? You could bridge to diet if you wanted to. You really could. You just need to start this lunch day today. But even better than that, you could go to water if you wanted to. Awesome. Get some good water, you know. But you got to just start. It's about starting. You're thinking, oh, I can never stop doing that, whatever that thing is. No, yeah, you can. Yeah, you, can. you need to develop the kinds of appetites for, and the kind of taste and desires for the things that God wants you to have. And t- take Diet Coke off and Coke and all that stuff off the end of the table. But think in your life, what needs to change? What bit of me needs to change? My anger? Is it my greed? Is it my obsession with self? I mean, I'm part of the selfie generation. We all are. The only thing the Bible says to do with ourselves is to deny ourselves. So deny your selfie. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. You take a selfie today. Don't worry, it's good. Put it on Insta. I'll follow you. It's, no, it's not a problem. It's no problem. All I'm saying is you can change what you think you can't live without. That can change. Why? Because there is a greater, higher object of your affections, and that's Jesus. Uh, He's the one. He really is the one. You need look no further. Eugene, the sage, Christ is the person in whom God's will is victoriously accomplished. The church is the community in which we know and are known by God. Worship is the action by which we practice and enjoy the presence of the creating and redeeming God. So we get together to worship him. And this is one of the reasons I need the church. You need the church as well. I can't do this in isolation. But I need to be reminded by you and you need to be reminded by me that we all need him. And that the reason we do is because he's the only one that can actually redeem. He's the only one that can actually reorder my priorities, redirect my affections, and transform my mind and my heart and my soul into the image of Jesus Christ, the incomparable Christ. He's the only one that can do that, and I need him, and I need you as well. And I'll close with Raymond Brown. Christ's essential uh, work for mankind has been effectively accomplished. Our part is to hear all right, we're doing that. To believe, I hope you're doing that. To obey, all right, from here forward, and share this word of abundant life with others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Hebrews. What an amazing book this has been for 18 weeks for us. Thank you for stirring us up. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in all your beauty and all your majesty, Jesus. Um, thank you for calling us to yourself. May the good seed of God's word take root and bear fruit in our lives. May the Holy Spirit use our study of the scriptures to transform our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, Equip us in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen.